Jack and Daxter was a franchise that never really knew what it wanted to be. From a light-hearted platformer, it transformed into a dystopian GTA clone, then into a Mad Max-themed minigame collection, and then into an admittedly badass racing game. And of course, there were the PSP spin-offs. Daxter was remembered fondly as an enjoyable, although kind of generic platformer, perfect for Sony's handheld. Jack and Daxter The Lost Frontier, though, was a completely different story. Developed by High Impact Games, also responsible for the Rats and Clank PSP games, and published by Sony in 2009, it's considered the black sheep of the series. Honestly, I can't find a single review of this game that doesn't shit on it to oblivion and back. And you know what? I don't appreciate that. Because while The Lost Frontier is indeed the worst Jack and Daxter game, it had a lot of unique and interesting ideas, and actually did some things better than its PS2 predecessors. So let's give this game some love, and examine why it's enjoyable and not as bad as people say. Judging by Jack and Daxter's appearance, the game's story takes place after the events of Jack X. The world is running out of eco, so our heroes, along with someone vaguely resembling Kira, travel to the edge of the world, also known as the Brink, to find a way to sort things out. Yeah, apparently the Precursors never completed the creation of this world. Maybe they were lazy, maybe the Dark Makers got them, I don't know. In Jack 3 you can kind of see the planet being pretty complete and there's still a sky surrounding the brink, so I guess they just didn't put enough landmasses around. Anyway, Jack and Daxter and bootleg Kira get attacked by sky pirates who try to steal their eco. Jack tries to fend them off using his dark powers, but then remembers that the PSP doesn't have an L2 button, so he fails to transform and the team crash lands on a nearby island. So far, it's a very interesting premise, introducing some new and unique ideas to the series, like the Brink and Sky Pirates. Some people don't like them as a concept, but if Jack can be Mad Max, I don't see any reason it can't be Treasure Planet as well. The eco shortage is a bit silly though, it's like saying the world is running out of quarks or something. Another thing people don't enjoy is the characters themselves. Daxter remains relatively unchanged and thank god for Max Casella for another stellar performance. Jack is now voiced by Josh Keaton and while he's not nearly as iconic as Mike Erwin, I think he does a great job at being Jack and the less scruffy voice is a better fit for the light-hearted adventure that this game is. They did Kira dirty though, even though she has the same voice actress as Jack 3. The tomboy we knew and loved in Jack 1 and 2 is gone, replaced by an annoying twat, always dismissive and even demeaning of Jack and Daxter. I didn't enjoy Kira in this game and she gets worse as the story progresses. Anyway, Jack has to find a way to fix the ship and so the game begins with an actual platforming level, which is a hell of a lot better than what Jack 3 tried to do with its intro. Nothing too complex, it's just a tutorial level, but it's a good place to talk about the game's controls and graphics. I'm playing the PS2 version for this review, which has better controls but worse graphics than the PSP one, a compromise I'm willing to make. The game isn't spectacular graphics-wise anyway. Models and textures are pretty basic, the colors are muted and washed out, and the effects are nothing to write home about. As for the controls, the PSP's limitations led to Jack having a pretty gutted moveset. He can no longer duck, roll, high and long jump, and of course no dark or light Jack either. I'm not too annoyed about that, I barely used the dark and light forms anyway, they were gimmicky and had no real importance gameplay or plot-wise. But Jack's moveset being so simple and basic does annoy me, because it's what makes the original PS2 game so enjoyable, even if they're chock full of mini games and pointless activities. As if that's not enough, Jack feels way stiffer and harder to control than in the PS2 trilogy. His jumping barely has any air control, his punches are weak and don't even push back enemies, and his spin kick is way too floaty. 
You also can chain some moves like you used to in the original trilogy, which makes Jack's movement somewhat disappointing compared to the PS2's fluid and varied moveset. You get used to it eventually, but still, it's not as polished as I would have liked. Anyway, our heroes manage to repair their ship and take off, intending to save the battleship from Sky Pirates. This is where we get introduced to the game's second main gameplay element, the aerial dogfights. These are a major part of the Lost Frontier's action, just like how Jack Free was more of a driving game than a platformer. Thankfully, the ships here control much better and you can do a lot of cool maneuvers with them, like spins and combat rolls. After destroying a whole bunch of pirate ships, you meet the battleship's captain, Duke Skyhead, leader of Europa, a small city in the clouds where Jack gets the blaster rifle, so his skills with a weapon can be tested. Europa's gun course is a good introduction to the Lost Frontier's gunplay, which is fairly similar to the PS2 titles, but that isn't high praise. You get almost all the classic Jack 2 weapons at least, the blaster rifle, the scattergun, and the Vulcan Fury, but no Peacemaker. Instead, you get a new weapon called the Lobber, which is pretty much the plasmite RPG from Jack 3. Aiming is determined by the character's direction. There is a hefty amount of auto-aim to make things easier, but unfortunately gun combat is just as finicky as in the PS2 games. Combined with the fact that enemies are bullet sponges and the guns lack the amount of kick and power they had in Jack 2 and 3, shooting is not a satisfying experience. Not to mention you shoot with a triangle button in the PSP version, which is just bad. The duo exits the gun course and Daxter, clumsy as he is, falls down a sewer grate and gets soured with that purple drunk, I mean Dark Eco, which transforms him into Dark Daxter. And oh boy is he something. Lore-wise, it makes no sense. Daxter is an oddsell, so the Dark Eco should have turned him into a Dark Maker or just killed him outright. Narratively, it is of no significance, as at the end of each Dark Daxter section, he simply transforms back, like nothing happened. Gameplay-wise, it's boring and pointless. Dark Daxter can shoot projectiles, ground pound, grab and throw enemies wherever he wants. It's an incredibly basic beat-em-up with some equally basic puzzle solving. It's not bad per se, but it's not engaging either. It's filler content that serves no real purpose. Thankfully, there are only three Dark Daxter sections in the game, and they don't take that long to complete. Still the weakest part of the game in my opinion. After all that, our heroes finally reunite with Duke Skyhead and receive the Eco Seeker, an artifact that can guide its user to the Eco Core, which I guess is important because it has all of the Eco, obviously. They don't hold on to it for long though. Pirates ambush them and Captain Phoenix steals the Eco Seeker and kidnaps Kira. Yeah, some kidnapping. What was he hoping to accomplish by jumping on his ship anyway? Grab the Seeker and then skydive to the planet's core? You idiot! After a short aerial chase sequence, we get introduced to Daxter Jacking, which allows Daxter to hijack ships and steal scrap, weapons and mods from them. It's just a series of quick time events that get old pretty fast, especially when you're trying to 100% the game. Thankfully, you can mostly ignore it, it's just an optional little feature for variety I suppose. Once again, we crash land and have to find the means to fix our ship. Along the way, we get the scattergun, meet bootleg Vin who fixes our ship and acquire our first eco power, the red eco amplifier. Eco powers are a large part of the game's combat and puzzle solving. And I love it, they add more variety to the gameplay and are implemented much better than the dark and light powers of the original trilogy. You can shoot explosive projectiles, rocket jump, slow down time, teleport, and use a shield to protect yourself. Each power can be used and combined to traverse dangerous platforming sections or to get the upper hand in combat, and their integration is pretty interesting and seamless. Hell of a lot better than what Zack 2 did with Dark Jack, which was just an occasional screen clearing bomb, and Zack 3's light powers, which would be used once and then never again. 
With our ship fixed once again, we fight the Sky Pirates and manage to disable and board their ship. Surprisingly, Kira is all fine and dandy with the pirates and demands Jack and Phoenix cooperate in finding the Eco Seeker, but they just lost due to their fighting. Yeah, Phoenix tried to steal from you and kill Jack, and Jack has already killed countless of Phoenix's friends and fellow Sky Pirates. What a great idea to work together! Anyway, from now on, Phoenix's ship is our base of operations, and we can now upgrade our ships or enhance our powers using any dark eco we have found during our adventures. These light RPG elements really add to the experience, and they are the game's strongest point. Using scrap, you can buy new weapons and modifications or upgrade the ones you have and then install them on your ship in whichever way you see fit. There is a large variety of different equipment you can acquire and it helps keep things fresh and makes you feel more powerful as the game progresses. It's a great way to make aerial dogfights a more integral part of the experience, something that Jack Free was really missing, given the fact that most of that game is driving in the desert. It also makes visiting and exploring the different hub areas more worthwhile, as you'll find different side activities and races that reward you with scrap or equipment, making you stronger in the process. Zack can also increase his stats and eagle powers, using dark eagle that Kira transforms into different colors. Depending on the eco color, you can increase your health, power up your melee attacks with new abilities, or make your eco powers stronger and easier to use repeatedly. Improving your character and your vehicles helps make the gameplay deeper and more involved and also adds some replayability and tactical thinking regarding your upgrade path. Although increasing your health is a top priority, because this game doesn't mess around. With the pirate ship unlocked as our main hub and with the ability to travel between the different areas of the brink, the game opens up as we explore the lands trying to find the Eco Seeker and repair it with the necessary items. This is where we learn that the Europans are actually the bad guys and want to use Dark Eco to rule the world. Discount Vin was a Dark Eco Sage, and Phoenix was working with Duke Skyhead until he decided enough was enough and left, kidnapping the Sage so that the experiments wouldn't continue. Man, everyone is an asshole in this story! Anyway, after finding the final item needed to fix the Eco Seeker, the team's battleship gets attacked and you have to protect it in the longest aerial combat mission yet. So far, the game has kept a pretty good pace of platforming and optional challenges, but in the game's second half things kind of start dragging on with long, repetitive aerial missions that have overly strict quick-time events for some reason. They're not difficult, and there are checkpoints at least, but it's just aerial mission after aerial mission back to back, with no platforming in between to break things up, so it starts getting a bit monotonous. At least the soundtrack absolutely slaps and makes the experience a bit more tolerable. Approaching the Lost Frontier's final act, we learn the location of the Eco Core, but get confronted by Duke Skyhead and betrayed by Phoenix's right hand. Wait, there are dollars in Jack's universe? I thought precursor orbs were this world's currency. Doesn't matter though, the betrayer gets killed almost immediately and the team manages to escape Sky Heat pretty easily. A few aerial fights, platforming segments and Daxter hamster ball sequences happen, which are pretty impossible to control by the way, and we end up taking the fight to the Europans themselves. Nothing of note happens here, except for this boss fight that's harder than the final boss itself, which is Duke Skyhead in his dark form. I guess he doesn't have to worry about the L2 button, only the lack of background music. Both bosses are pretty easy if you use the Eco Shield and Lover, and Dark Skyhead is a pretty fun fight, with different faces and attacks keeping things interesting and engaging. Unfortunately, this isn't the end, not even close. We have to chase Skyhead on our ship and destroy his battleship in one last aerial fight. Jack Free had the sense to put the vehicle part of the final boss fight first, to create the appropriate flow and tension, so I don't know why they screwed it up here. 
Anyway, Phoenix sacrifices himself, resolving the weird love triangle energy that existed throughout the game. The battleship is destroyed and the Eco Core is finally unleashed, ending the storms and saving the world from the Eco Shortens. One sloppy kiss, a hint at the sequel that never happened, and the Monty Python reference are the game's final moments. I'm gonna be honest here, Jack and Daxter The Lost Frontier is not a great game. It is indeed the weakest of the franchise. But damn it, that doesn't make it a bad game. It's a pretty decent and enjoyable experience. The platforming, although clunky, is serviceable. The soundtrack is amazing and I loved the aerial combat and the RPG mechanics of the game, as they were implemented much better than in the PS2 games. The story and the characters were forgettable and I didn't care for the minigames, just like in every Jack and Daxter game. Looking at you, Dark Daxter, would I recommend it? If you think of A Lost Frontier as a spin-off and the thematic link between Jack 1 and 2, then yeah, it's a fun time. Otherwise, you'll be pretty disappointed that it's not the Jack 4 you wanted, but frankly, that's never gonna happen anyway. And that's all I had to say about Jack and Daxter, The Lost Frontier. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a like if you did, comment your thoughts below, and subscribe for more stuff. You know how it goes. Have a great day, and until next time, take care and have fun.